Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome inside the Guilty as Charge podcast. It's good to be back. I miss the the little vibes that we have in our uh, pre lead up song. So uh, good to be here as always. My name is Stephen. I am the host, and joining me are my guys Tyler and Alex. Alex, we'll start with you, man. How are you doing tonight? Uh, doing good. I don't have to do any three and a half hour streams for another year, probably. So I'm much more comfortable with our one hour stream. So let's let's keep it that way for now. Yeah, you know, uh, shout out to Kyle and Gavino and Maddie, of course, for uh, holding it down while Tyler, Arjun and I were were in Vegas. So you guys crushed it and uh, appreciate uh, those other three stepping up and uh, filling the void a little bit. So Tyler's here as well, man. Tyler, how you doing? I'm doing very well. As fun as filming in a million dollar studio at the Wynn in Vegas was, there's something about just being back home in your little corner that feels just right. I love being here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man, it's good to be back. It's good to be back here with Alex as well. And you kind of get back into a routine a little bit. Um, Before we get started today, you know, I just want to, you know, ask Tyler a little bit, uh, you know, about his your experience, you know, attending the draft in person, man. How was it for you? It was awesome. Uh, I think Vegas did a really good job. It was somehow very casual. We thought we'd have to sign in and do all this and that. No, you just walk up. We got practically front row of the back row, that is. And it was great. I had a lot of fun. Of course, it was great being there with with you, obviously, Steven and Arjun, meeting some other guys like Jack and so many other people from the diehard bolt clubs and all that. So that was a lot of fun. There's something about you know, obviously it's great hanging out with Steven again, but the thing about being there with Arjun and hearing his visceral reactions to trade ups <laughs> for linebackers and running backs, it just yeah. made it really special. I loved that so much. Yeah. You know, it's a really unique fa- fan experience in general because like, obviously things get leaked out on Twitter. Right. But when you're there in person and like, not everybody has great service and my phone died. And so you just have like no idea what's going on until Roger Goodell gets up in the state up on the stage and says, Oh, the, the Eagles have traded up. They're going to get, uh, you know, Jordan Davis right here, or the Detroit Lions have traded up. And you're just like, wait, what is going on? So uh, very unique fan experience, but it was a lot of fun getting to, uh, not to say that Brooke doesn't care about the draft, right? But usually I just kind of watch the draft on my own. Like Brooke's just kind of like, I don't know who these people are. And so uh, just getting to watch people that you know and like can have a conversation with was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was awesome just getting into the Chargers social media video. Another flex. I'm just throwing them out there. Uh, the Chargers social media video for the reaction to the Zion Johnson signing. Yeah. And just just being the happiest, loudest people there. Everyone's taking edge rushers, <laughs> wide receiver, you know, Jamison Williams, trade ups. But by golly, Zion Johnson's the pick. And we we were the loudest people there for sure. Yeah, everybody around us, you know, we were around mostly, I feel like Jets fans, like there were some Lions fans. And they were like, man, you guys really like your guards, huh? And I was like, damn right we do. Of course we do. <laughs> so it was it was a great time for sure. And uh, Alex, of course, you know, got to uh, cover it all live. So um, we'll kind of see what happens next year. I'm definitely not making a trip out of Kansas City. I can tell you that right now. I uh, will be streaming from here uh, with you guys. So, um, all right, let's let's uh, let's talk about today's show. Like I said, we will kind of have our final draft thoughts, but we have to get started with the latest news that the Chargers have signed Bryce Callahan. And we'll also talk about a certain defensive tackle in a second here. Um, This is a fantastic move to me, um, but I want to get Tyler's thoughts here first because, you know, Tyler did all this great work on composite rankings, compiling stats and things like that. And uh, Bryce Callahan was actually the highest ranked slot corner, slot free agent corner uh, that Tyler was able to kind of, compile this the statistics for so tyler initial thoughts on uh the Chargers' decision to sign bryce callahan much of the theme of the last week i didn't know he was available felt the same way with spiller felt the same way with sailor during the draft i didn't actually didn't know he was still available i couldn't have told you what team he went to but i didn't know but it's nice to see that the chargers signed a 5-9 free agent slot corner from denver denver who will be 31 this year who was signed as a former who was a former undrafted free agent but became a great slot corner uh, with a solid 80-ish pro football focus coverage grade. Um, although it did dip to about the high 60s in his last season with Denver. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Chris Harris Jr.'s nose. Let me try again. Um, <laughs> so the Chargers signed a 5'9 free agent slot corner from Denver. Yeah, so they're basically, like in terms of just looking at that and that profile, they're exactly the same. So I, I've sort of seen the end of this movie before. With that said, I'm very happy that they're adjusting to 
you know, the draft not really maybe going their way at a certain point. Don't know what their plans would have been. Obviously, when Zion Johnson and then basically ignored corner in a, in a truly meaningful impact start kind of way um, the entire rest of the draft. But I did want to bring up one thing on the stream here, which is the defensive personnel differences between the Chargers and the Rams uh, with Brandon Staley, of course. So the Rams in 2020, uh, for those who are listening, I'll try to explain it for those watching. Hopefully you can see it. Um, but if not, I can link it in the description. So in 2020, the Rams' three main... I, I wish I could draw or like write on this, but I can't. But in 2020, the Rams' three main personnel groupings, they all had five or six defensive backs, which are boxed in the red here. Um, and then altogether, something like you know 800 snaps in those three alignments altogether. So it's 2-3-6, 2-4-5, 3-3-5. But the base 3-4, which is in blue there, was maybe used like 90 times and far below the average. The black bar is league average. The blue is their average. So in 2021, which again, Brandon Staley joins the Chargers, everything changes quite a bit. And there's not quite that same distribution, right? The Chargers had to run, you know, about three times as much 3-4, base 3-4. Yeah, and most and their most used personal grouping by far was 2-4-5 at over 500 snaps, running with, you know, four linebackers. Whereas in 2020 with the Rams, it was more balanced at just under 300. So I think having Bryce Callahan and really just all their additions, even a JT Woods, just allows them to do more, get out of that four linebacker group, get into more defensive backs on the field, which we kind of speculated. But it's also nice to just visualize the difference between what Brandon Staley ran with the Rams in this first slide here and then what the Chargers ran last year. I thought that they basically just couldn't escape having four linebackers on the field. They had to at some point, obviously, if you count Ed Rushers as you know, outside linebackers, they had to run their 3-4, base 3-4 so much. You know Brandon Staley wants to get out of that, and I really think that they are going to be able to with Callahan with Woods, with J.C. Jackson, and all their other draft picks and some signings. Yeah, no, um, I, I didn't realize that the I didn't realize that Bryce Callahan was five nine. First of all, and I also didn't realize that it was drastically similar to Chris Harris. I will say the difference is he's only on a one year deal. Chris Harris was on a two year, twelve mm -hmm. ish million dollar deal. I guess when he signed here, something along those lines. Um, but so for me, there's a little bit less risk involved. Obviously, um, I mean, the, the real story regarding Callahan and whether he'll pan out or not is the, the injuries over the last few years, which have kind of plagued his career in Denver. Otherwise, he is kind of the best slot corner in the league. You can certainly make that argument. Um, it's just going to be about whether he's on the field enough. So you definitely do see some signs of decline. Uh, but I also just think he'll be asked to do a little bit less I think than when Chris Harris was sort of brought in here uh I I think you know he was pretty much asked to be CB3 from the get-go uh and then sort of had this weird transition between the 4-3 and 3-4 defenses where he still kind of kept that slot corner role um but also gained a couple other responsibilities so I think Bryce Callahan being your sort of slot but like CB4 in a way is kind of fine for him being on a one-year deal so I do think there are some age associated risk, injury associated risks, but it's ultimately pretty low risk, high reward. Um, and then if he obviously balls out in this year of Staley's defense, you probably let him walk in free agency and then you get a comp pick for him. Right. Like, I mean, that's kind of what I think the goal is for this signing in terms of Staley sort of um, trying to rehabilitate the career of Bryce Callahan a little bit after all these years of injuries. Uh, so for me, I, I think this is a 10 out of 10 signing, especially post the draft where we all complain, no corners, no corners, no corners, um, yeah. getting, getting Bryce Callahan after all of that, I, I think is really good. Yeah. So just really quickly, Chris Harris was a two year, $17 million deal. Oh, <laughs> I, oh I undersold that one. It was way worse. <laughs> <laughs> I think the last but, year was 12 and a half, if I'm not mistaken, or 12.4. Yeah. yeah. His year yeah. one, Oof. his year one cap hit was much worse, which is why. Wow. You know, yeah. the, the decision to cut Casey Hayward and Chris Harris financially was, you know, a right. no brainer towards cutting Chris towards, towards towards cutting Casey Hayward. Excuse me. Yeah, that was um, when they uh, missed out on Brady and were just like, we'll just throw money anywhere. Yeah. And it was eight and a half mil per Chris was, Harris. Which and is it was Chris Harris and Brian Bulaga and, you know, and Linval Joseph. But Linval Joseph was at least good for them and stayed on the field. Um, you know, and Chris Harris at one point, you know, last year, year before that was arguably cb2 like it was just such a bad fit from the schematic standpoint from a talent standpoint but you know he's gone now <laughs> so uh, the callahan signing to me is fantastic because i think this is just it gives them legitimate depth and legitimate options like tyler was talking about and um you know that's kind of been 
the theme of the off season, I think is just getting a more deep team. And, you know, after the draft, I'm sitting there going, okay, like really how much did they improve the depth? Because I think just here, Taylor, Dean Leonard, will get into them, you know, more specifically down the road, but it's like, they're not really better than Tavon Campbell at this point, you know? So Tavon Campbell essentially is going to be handed the CB4 spot and, and just kind of, they're just going to run it back essentially and, and swap out JC Jackson for Chris Harris, which obviously is an improvement. But now you have a legitimate option to kind of challenge him. And so you have Bryce Callahan, you have Tavon Campbell, who have played some good ball at stretches of their career. Obviously, I feel like Bryce Callahan is kind of the more reliable piece there. And the issue for him in the past has been health because he's been relied upon so heavily as a starter. Well, he's not going to be a starter here. And so I think this is a really good signing just purely for depth purposes. Again, we haven't really gotten the full details of, of his contract. I can't imagine it's going to be a lot. But I was concerned, man. I really was. After the draft about the depth at corner, I'm still concerned about edge rusher, which we'll get into, of course. But um, now you have Bryce Callahan. You have Tavon Campbell. You have Jasir Taylor. You have options. And Staley said on Saturday they reportedly hold Kimon Hall in high regard. So uh, we'll kind of see what happens there. But you have legitimate competition. You have legitimate depth. And I think that was a it was definitely something that – needed to be addressed and you get somebody like Bryce Callahan. He's familiar with the scheme, gives them more options, gives them more depth. I think this is a really good post draft signing. Yeah, I completely agree. And and just a really good win. Again, I hope they do this with tackle or edge rusher. Yeah. Or both. Both would be great. It's just a good way to understand that you didn't get what you wanted in the drop. Like you have players like Jasir Taylor, who I like, and you can develop down the line, but he's not starting right away. He's not like you just can't watch that drop off from I'm not saying he's an undrafted free agent, but he was projected to be one. And so the Chargers yeah. just couldn't go again from I have the best safety in the league or the best corner in the league to my God, here's an undrafted free agent. Like there just had to be something in the middle. And so I'm yeah. so glad that Callahan is signed, even though he probably won't be an outside guy to them. It still gives them options. Someone gets hurt. This person kicks outside, whatever. Like it just it feels so much better. And I hope they do the same thing for the edge group. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I hope they do the same thing for offensive tackle and edge. Um, not to get too crazy, but if you go grab like a Dennis Kelly kind of player for you know the, maybe the same like close to minimum price you're playing uh, you're paying for Bryce Callahan, I think that'd be great. Um, I you know kind of did list like Chris Rumpf as like a stock up in my video because they're sort of relying on him to be edge three now. But if you want to go get another player like that, um, I mean, it's pretty minimal cost at this point, so there's not uh, really a lot to you know, there are not, not a lot of reasons to not do it. So for me, I, I think you just got to go after those players. Uh, don't think they will necessarily go after an edge, but I feel like offensive tackle death just has to be in the cards um, unless they're really bullish on Pipkins, like Telesco said last off season. So we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we can talk about that in, in later on in the show, kind of how the Chargers went about this offseason with the offensive line. But, you know, in terms of cornerback and the secondary in general, like I – the body types that they have are just so interesting to me because, you know, I, the, my first thought of like signing Bryce Callahan was like, oh, like, who are you playing in the division, right? Like you have all these route running types with the Raiders, with Devontae Adams and with Hunter Renfro. And it's like, obviously, you're not going to put Bryce Callahan on Devontae Adams, but I'm going to trust Bryce Callahan to go guard Hunter Renfro, man, probably more than I would Michael Davis in this point. And so um, maybe even Asante Samuel Jr. So. It's just a really good depth signing, gives them options. I, I still think that Asante Samuel Jr. and JC Jackson will be kind of the starting outside corners. And then, then once they go into the nickel packages, dime packages, now they have options. You know, if you have a, a legitimate slot receiver, you can put Bryce Callahan there. Or if you have a better outside receivers, you can do Michael Davis. You want to bring Mark Webb in as the sixth defensive back. You want to bring um, JT Woods in as that sixth th defensive back. I think you just have more options now, and that's what Staley wanted. Yeah, I just also think it's really interesting how they're kind of built now, how they have these like long and big safeties, but their corners are, you know, kind of did get <laughs> smaller uh, yeah. in a sense with the Bryce Callahan signing. Um, so that's something I'm curious to see how they handle that in the regular season when they do go against like these bigger star wide receivers. Um, obviously, not like a ton of like those just big guys in the division. Um, but as you, you know, just play teams around the league, I'm curious to see how they'll handle that. Uh, and, you know, maybe 
you have Michael Davis, but I don't think you just want to rely on him in that uh, instance for size. So I definitely think they'll have to do a little bit of toying around with the safety group and, and how it's currently constructed as well. Yeah, that'll be a... I'm really interested to see how JT Woods does in camp and during the preseason. I just... Like, obviously, you can use Derwin James, and that's the point. Like, if there's a bigger guy, you can just use Derwin James. But I'm curious to see how JT Woods would hold up because I think he's fine in coverage, but it's more of like a click and close, reading react sort of way, not necessarily manning up on Travis Kelsey. So, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see how he does, but hopefully they have some sort of plan here because, like you said, it's just it's kind of Michael Davis as your big corner. And then after that, nobody else is. Now, they, I think JC Jackson plays bigger. I just, he just is physically not bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there is Michael Davis. And like Thomas points out, you know, Davis had, you know, a, a good amount of success last year before he got injured against Travis Kelsey and Darren Waller. He had played Darren Waller very tough in 2020. So it is an interesting balance. And, you know, really outside of Davis, the only other long physical corner is Dean Leonard, who, again, we'll talk about in a second. But um, I do think they need a little bit more balance there so we'll move on to our next topic here before we talk more in depth about the draft and that is about the chargers decision to decline the fifth year option on jerry tillery so we're so close man we're so close to being done with this guy i can't wait (laughs) um (laughs) i have never been like more disappointed in my life than like going to bat for this guy and call and calling him as my breakout pick because you did see those flashes in 2019 and then in 2020 and then it just goes to shit man so um yeah so uh, no fifth year option for jerry tillery ian rapaport said that he's in their long-term plans though according to tom telesco so alex uh your takeaway here about the decision on jerry tillery yeah um i'll break this news to you um he's not in their long-term plans (laughs) (laughs) like the breaking news uh this was just obvious like i mean i i felt like the, the fact that it's such an indictment on jerry tillery that Tom Telesco has picked up every other first, uh, you know, first round pick, fifth year option. Jason Verrett, who could not stay healthy to save his life, sadly, uh, picked him up. Melvin Gordon, first round running back, picked him up. Like every single one except Jerry Tillery. And that lets you know about the kind of player and production that you got out of Jerry Tillery as well, yeah. as I think his character to some extent. Um, and just never improved if the chargers really thought that this breakout year was going to be 2022 i think they would have picked it up you know if they really thought it was coming but to me he's fully out of their plans um too much of a liability in the run game not much as a pass rusher i mean he got a little bit better this year which is to say he was less terrible than he was the other years but uh just kind of has consistently been the same player hasn't improved and I think that says a lot for, for an organization that has very clearly wanted to keep these talents. Every time you hear Telesco speak at the draft, you know, uh, at the combine press conference, and he's like, okay, yeah, we want to pick up Mike Williams. We want to pick up Derwin James. We want to pick up all these guys. You never heard that with Jerry Tillery. Um, yeah. And so I think it's sad. We all had pretty high expectations for him when he was drafted. Uh, but for me, it was obvious sort of in 2020 that this was going to pan out. Um, and has been obvious not that i'm gonna do like a whole victory tour here uh because i i think the team is worse off for him being a bust um as as far as the long-term plans thing i mean you know we've seen fifth year uh option guys get declined and then come back the cowboys sort of just did that uh with leighton vanderesh and brought him back for a year so you know is there a chance that in the future the chargers just go well we can't find anything better right now so <laughs> here's a one year two and a half million dollar contract jerry uh sure that's possible uh but to me I-, I really don't think there's much of any chance he's back and even if he does have that breakout season given the chargers financial situation currently um you probably just let him walk and get a comp pick from it uh so for me i, I think jerry tillery this is clearly his last season as a charger uh, his, his Twitter deletions uh, w- would lead you to believe that he thinks this is his last season as a Charger as well. Um, and I am sad it didn't work out. But to me, this is the best decision for the team uh, by far going forward. Yeah, I initially thought, I think I messaged you guys, I thought they were kind of going to play it you know, safe in the middle. But then you think about, yeah, their cap situation, the fact that they could get a comp pick there. And then obviously Otito Ogbonia, who I do think maybe won't play his Tillery specific role 
but can move enough guys around where you just have a starting three next year, no problem. Um, yeah, I just, where do you start with Tillery? I wasn't the biggest fan when they drafted him. And unfortunately, nothing's really changed. I mean, you know, 67th in pass rush productivity, 77th in pass rush win rate. Like if he was at least good in that regard, like Sebastian Joseph Day is not a pass rusher by any means, but he's also number one in run stops or run stop rate or whatever it was. So you yeah. do have a reason to keep him on the field. You know, Tillery just not being a good pass rusher and then also 117th in run stop rate is not great so it was it was time to me you know yeah jerry tillery has been a bust i guess compared to you know some of the other guys that telesco has drafted but i also just think this regime is not going to continue to sink resources and time and effort into something they know it's just it's just not going to happen and so i'm happy that you know they might have done that for like a dj fluker although fluker did kick inside the guard so i understand why you know they would probably would have done that for melvin gordon and whatnot but I think they just know at this point that Tillery is just not going to be what they want him to be. And so it's a bit refreshing, even though I, I would love for him to break out. But it's refreshing to know that they're like, listen, we know where you're at. We're going to move on. Like, even though they did sign Eric Banks and that did not work, and we kind of all knew that was not a great move, they at least got rid of it very quickly. And so I think Jerry Tillery, while I didn't think they're going to cut or trade him by any means, it's good to know that they're like, hey, we know what we got here and we're not going to continue to waste more of our time and resources. Yeah, and it's just going to be really interesting to see because, I mean, you and I have both heard that, you know, he's the golden boy and not just by the GM, right? Like the coaching staff would, during the season at least, was very high on him. And so now you don't, you have the fifth-year option declined. His time with the Chargers potentially, you know, is limited to just one season. And it is going to be curious just kind of how that role plays itself out because right now, Jerry Tillery is – the only pass rushing defensive tackle that they have, like in terms of physical profile, like obviously he's not super good at it, but uh, apparently Michael Davis is tweeting out a bunch of eye emojis. Yeah, he did. There's nothing. Nobody else is tweeting it. It's just him. Uh, five eye emojis. Five eyeball so, emojis. Yeah. I don't know if that's uh, big news. Hopefully. I don't know. Uh, is, is there a game going on? No, I think he tweeted five eye emojis for the fifth year option not being picked up for Jerry Tillery. <laughs> That's very good synergy, Michael. I really appreciate yeah. that. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Michael, watching yeah. the show. Michael Davis is, yeah. is in here in his burner account listening to us talk shit about Jerry Tillery, his, his BFF. So <laughs> shout out Michael Davis, man. Uh, he was at the, the draft on Friday night. So shaved head, man. Shaved head. Looks a little uh, interesting. Um, but yeah, the, the Jerry Tillery thing, and it's going to be interesting just from a profile standpoint because I mean, Joe Gaziano is kind of that guy, I guess. But right now, you know, you have like the presumed guys ahead of him, at least in terms of playing time. You know, Austin Johnson, Sebastian Joseph Day, Christian Covington, Tito, Ogbonia, and even Braden Fogo. Like, none of those guys are like pass rushing types. They're all run stuffing guys first and foremost. And, you know, I feel really good about that group. But, you know, Brandon City has always had that one other pass rusher, sometimes even two. So it is interesting, man. I, like, Gavino has kind of floated the idea of bringing in Morgan Fox and Gavino thinks he can be the third edge rusher. I think he's more of a Tillery type, but like, what if you bring in Fox and then you kind of have a competition with him and Jerry Tillery as that one pass rushing type, I think would be uh, get the popcorn ready for that. That'd be fun. Are we talking ourselves into a Morgan Fox, Jerry Tillery training camp competition? Is that, I mean, I'd rather have Morgan Fox right now than Jerry Tillery, man. <laughs> Probably, I, I guess. Yeah, but like that's that's very sad that that's where we are with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the Chargers have just set themselves up to be a team next year that's going to get some kind of comp pick for Jerry Tillery when he moves on. Uh, probably some six round pick, and you try to get a pass rushing DT next year in the draft, yeah. and you know that's a three four year contract. Um, you know, with the way that they're set up, I don't think they're going to be players in free agency to go get a pass rushing DT, but um, it, it's things that didn't work out with Jerry Tillery because in, in theory it should have. Um, but yeah, I mean, the work ethic was just work ethic was never there and always got washed out of the run game. Yeah. I think the chargers, you know, kind of transition here. I think they have a clear, you know, line of succession, if you will, right? Like Tito will take on the Christian Covington role next year. And then Jerry Tillery's replacement will come through the draft at that time next year. There's just there's just no way unless he they sign him to a super cheap deal that he's in their future plans at all because 
Right now, they're projected at $8 million in cap space. Again, that could change a little bit based off of you know where that cap number is specifically. But they can't afford to sign him and then also have Sebastian Joseph Day, Austin Johnson. Like It, it just doesn't make any financial sense. I don't think it makes roster sense either. So they can get a pass rushing defensive tackle uh, in the draft next year. So, uh, guys, any final thoughts here about uh, Bryce Callahan or Jerry Tillery before we uh, dive into this draft class? Hope they ball out. Hope they have 50 interceptions and 100 sacks and get great comp picks for them. <laughs> Man, lots of comp pick talks. That, you know, ever since Kyle came on, we've been talking all about comp picks. So, uh, shout out to Kyle, official member of the Guilty as Charged podcast. Uh, go check him out. Go show him some love. So, uh, all right, let's uh, let's get into this draft class. Of course, uh, you know we talked a little bit on Saturday about our final thoughts. Then a little bit has changed. Uh, you know, watching some film, had some time to think on it. Uh, I'm sure Alex has some very positive thoughts about Isaiah about the Isaiah Spiller selection that we can we that he'll share with us. Um, but let's get let let's start broad and then kind of you know zone in a little bit more. So Alex, just kind of your General thoughts of how you would characterize this specific draft class for Tom Telesco and Brandon Staley. Uh, I thought it was a good draft class, considering what the resources were. Obviously, they were working with uh, one fewer pick uh, than they normally were. So obviously, there wasn't that like that day two steal kind of guy, you know, like they got in Asante Samuel Jr., for example, last year. Um, but they got the guy they wanted in Zion Johnson and that we all wanted at that point in the draft. So to me, you know, the, the commitment to being a trench team was there. And so I, I think pretty much everyone kind of universally loved that pick. I know every, some people were hoping for like a wide receiver, but for, for how the board fell, I think that was uh, perfect for the Chargers. Uh, JT Woods was a little bit perplexing because uh, as Tyler and all three of you pointed out on kind of the post-draft show, like maybe you could have gotten him around later, but I think with how he tends to, you know, get how he's going to get into the rotation, uh, I, I think it, you know, it, it makes sense that he's going to be there and I think he can fix the mix, missed tackle rate problem. Uh, I don't, I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue for him, but pretty clearly like an eventual Nasir Adderley replacement uh, once the Chargers move on from him and get a comp pick also, uh, since that's the theme of the show today. Uh, where things started getting wonky for me was day three. Um, because I had been talking on the show about like, oh, running back in round four. You know, I, I had been kind of talking about it. And I was sort of surprised they actually did it um, with, with the Isaiah Spiller pick. We'll get into that more later. But then... Because they went running back there, that sort of, I think, really took a lot of the cornerback edge options that were available in round four off the board from them. And then from that point, I thought it was, yeah, obviously, they get Salier in the, in the next round, which uh, I think is, is really great value. Um, but then from that point on, it's like all the cornerbacks and fullbacks and everything else they took was kind of like, okay, this is a depth special teams pick, which I'm fine with but doesn't necessarily like excite me like Jasir Taylor is, is, is going to be a special teams player this year. Uh, Dean Leonard is going to be a special teams player this year. So, I mean, there's value in that, of course. I mean, that's what you're drafting in the sixth or seventh round uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to go get some like wide receiver. And, and, and like Arjun said, they didn't veer too far off from the consensus board. Like they've been known to do sometimes <laughs> Lohi Gilman, uh, but, uh, you know, this time they didn't really veer too far off from it. So I think they got good value out of all those picks pretty much. Um, I guess I just kind of would have changed the order of day three up a little bit if they got, you know, like a Kobe Bryant type corner in the fourth round or an edge player, um, I would have been happier. And then you take someone like Jerome Ford in the fifth, or if you take a cornerback in the fourth or an edge in the fifth. And then you take a uh, who's the USC's running back's name that won the sixth round again? Keontae, Keontae Ingram. Ingram. You're right. If you get Keontae Ingram and then you take him in the sixth, I think that would have been kind of better too. So I, I think I really like day one. I like day two of the draft, but day three sort of fell apart for me uh, with the selection of the running back that kind of pigeonholed them into the other positions uh, that they ended up taking as well. The direction they ended up taking, I don't. I don't hate the Spiller pick. Uh, it's fine. 
but <laughs> I, I'm 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 troubled by the process uh, of kind of how the rest of day three played out as a result of it when they could have gotten better value running back probably with Ford in the fifth or Keontae Ingram in the sixth and then uh, kind of just had better depth there uh, and, and also the right tackle problem uh, like Nick mentions in the chat. Oh, sorry. I thought they were continuing. Um, I, I it wasn't. I wasn't as big a fan of this draft as last year's draft. So just for, and for whatever it's worth, people listening, I'm not grading them based on whether they got Glimak with the second or not. It's based on what they did with the picks that they had. And yeah, it was a bit of a surprise they didn't go after edge rusher at all. Uh, we could find out that they completely have an edge rusher, Trey Flowers, Clowney, Morgan Fox, whatever on tap but for right now based on what we know it's surprising to see them neglect that all together knowing how often they used you know three guys both inside one guy outside and obviously Khalil Mack and how often they're going to do that this year unless things are changing but I doubt it why change that and I get the confidence in Chris Rump no I understand why fans would be confident in Chris Rump because they really want to believe in him and he showed a lot of good flashes and against the run better than given credit for and i think that there's definitely a role for him but like we do have to consider where their edge three group is at chris rumpf emika egbule jamal davis those three guys last year combined not some of them didn't play but those three guys who are their three edge rushers behind the big two combined for four pressures and chris rumpf among rookies was the fewest in sacks and pressures and among the guys with as many uh, pass rush reps as he had, he was third worst in pass rush productivity, second worst in pass rush win rate. Run stop rate was good. Um, but then among edge rushers in the NFL as a whole, with as many pass rush snaps as he had, 136th or third worst in pressures. You know, pass rush productivity was 129th, ninth worst in the NFL. You know, 129th in pass rush win rate, also ninth worst in the NFL. Like this is, I said earlier, Jerry Tillery was like 67th, 77th in those categories. We're talking about Rumpf. Granted, he was a rookie who needed a lot of development and a fifth round guy, a fourth round guy, 136th, 129th, 129th. So it's just a surprise to see them not address it at all. And even if he's your edge three, okay, I can buy that. But to not even go after an edge four is definitely a surprise. So that was my biggest really just all the premium positions as a whole. Arjun just did a graphic today about the last five drafts and who's addressed the premium positions, the non-quarterback premium positions the most, and the Chargers are in that bottom left corner because they just yeah. really haven't. And, you know, that doesn't mean the players aren't. I, I really like a lot of these players in this group. I went through all of them, watched film on all of them, and I can understand at each point why they took these guys. And I like them. And I, if we get into individual guys, I'll talk about why and like, oh my gosh, Spiller in the fourth. Like, even though I would have liked running back later, I understand why you took him because he's going to be a steal. He's exactly what they needed. There was one of two things I think they needed there. And they did get one of those things out of him, possibly two. So, I, you know, again, I like these guys. It was just a surprise to see them not like, what were the mock drafts at 17? And now again, we don't know as much as the Chargers, obviously, but it was wide receiver, tackle, edge, corner. And those things basically were neglected the entire draft other yeah. than Jasir Taylor, who's going to be a slot corner in the sixth round. So it was, it was just a surprise. Uh, but watching this class as a whole, I feel about the same, but more positive because now I understand why you took these players. Like, okay, I see your role. I can see how almost every single one of these players makes an impact in year one. And that's really great. Like you do want to see that. Like, I, like the Chargers, there is a plan here. Whether you agree with the plan or not, there was some sort of plan here. I feel like the Lynn era, it was just like, I don't know, we'll take that guy. I don't know, we'll take that guy. Like, I want to be a run first team, but we're not going to build in the trenches. We're not going to take a good running back yeah. or whatever it is. Like, I at least see the plan, even though it wasn't what I expected. And frankly, I think there were some things that were off about the plan you know, before we get into an edge signing later. I at least see that there was a plan. So again, I like the players. They got some good value from the guys. It was a nice average draft, but I think they could get a lot out of it in the future just it just wasn't the positions i expected yeah I, th I think to me the biggest surprise of the draft was the the cornerback selection and coming in the sixth round just based off of what, off of what we were hearing um i just kind of am a little annoyed at how the question marks at edge are just kind of hanging over this draft class like because you know of course they signed bryce callahan and that's fantastic it makes a lot of sense 
but you don't have that other pass rusher and you need that other pass rusher. You know, the chances of Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, who are great players, and Tom Telesco was, was pretty sassy about, you know, hey, we have Khalil Mack. Like, we, that's what we use our second round pick for. And I get that. But the chances of those two players playing all 17 games are, are slim. And so I, I was wanting, you know, an edge rusher to come in and, and contribute. And, you know, once you get past the fourth round, the edge rusher pool kind of dries up. And, but even, you know, I would take some kind of Chris Rumpf competition, you know, seventh round dart throw. And, and minimum and we just didn't get that so i it's frustrating to me how much that position specifically is kind of hanging over the draft class for me because i do really like this draft i like the players that mm -hmm. they selected and i think they got good value like arjun was saying in terms of the consensus big board at each selection and you know that's just kind of where i'm at i think you can see a role for several of these players like tyler was saying and i think you could realistically get at least four instant contributors, maybe more, depending on kind of how the right tackle situation pans out. But again, I just like keep on going back. Like, okay, like what happens if Khalil Mack pulls a hammy and he misses five games? And then, you know, we're kind of just in the same situation at edge rusher that we were at cornerback last year where Chris Rump or an undrafted free agent or CFL player is starting games for them. Yeah, and I definitely don't, you know, hopefully I just say this to all the fans, like I don't subscribe to the, well, I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to trust. Like they have a plan, like the, the criticisms of the draft. I think we should all still be able to have them, even though yeah. it might even work out. Like we should all be able to still have criticisms about the draft and not just be like, oh, well, I trust that they have a plan because again, like we're Chargers fans, they ain't won nothing yet. So whatever the plan is, like we are allowed to be skeptical because it hasn't worked yet. Yeah, I'm also allowed to be skeptical specifically about running backs because you've taken two dog shit running backs the last two years. So <laughs> I, I'm 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 done with this. We're just gonna trust the process and it's fine. No, uh, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so I, I get people upset that we're negative or you know whatever, but I'm I'm not gonna you know Tom Telesco. I mean, we've talked about the draft metrics and and Arjun's brought them up. Like, you know, obviously not addressing these, you know, uh, premium positions like Arjun pointed out in that graph. Um, and, you know, aside from the first round, there's there's been some to like about his drafts, obviously, but particularly he struggled on day three of the draft. I mean, that's been a common theme in the Telesco era. So to me, to say that all, you know, four or five of those, you know, day three picks are going to pan out. Um, I just I, I don't buy that nearly as, as much as other people do. So. Uh, you know, obviously day three itself is kind of a crapshoot anyway, but you know, I'm also not going to be there to just be like, oh, well, let's hype all these guys up and then get disappointed <laughs> when they don't ban out. So, yeah, um, I, I do kind of uh, remain at arm's length distance for some of these picks. Yeah, I think it's all relative, right? Like, you know, the Chargers drafted Sam Tevy right in the sixth round and they drafted him yeah. to be you know, kind of like ideally that developmental tackle prospect and hey, maybe in a couple of years he could become a swing tackle. And then all Russell Kuhn got injured and then Joe Barksko got injured and it's like, oh shit, Sam Tevy is starting for us. And right away as a rookie and then he's in a playoff game and then in 2018 he's a full-time starter like legit, unquestioned. And then he's not very good because he was put in a poor situation and people are like, well, Sam Tevy's a bust. It's like, well... My guy was a six round pick. Like I, I'm happy for my guy, Utah player and all that, but it's about managing expectations for me. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about these day three picks, like if they become starters, fantastic, but it's just, you know, the expectations behind it, I think is a little off. So uh, a couple super chat questions here, uh, make the transition uh, and wants to know is Staley doing Telesco's job? No, no, but the defensive, additions are heavily influenced by what right. Staley wants to yeah. a yeah. greater degree than I've ever seen at the last on the in the Telesco era. I mean I I think Staley definitely has higher input than previous coaches have had. Yeah. Uh just kind of based on how these picks have gone. But I mean Telesco certainly has had some of his types in this draft though. So uh you know I, I don't think that that's uh, totally a Staley proposition though. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Tom Telesco has always collaborated with his coaches, right? I mean, there's the Josh Kelly pick, which was clearly an Anthony Lynn pick. There's the Kenneth Murray, which is clearly a Gus, Brad, Gus Bradley pick. It just feels like the process now is more refined and, you know, Brandon Staley is much more involved. And so um, just by judging off of like how they're speaking about things, Brandon Staley has a strong say in personnel. And, you know, I think that's really the difference. So Tom Telesco still has final say. It's his job to, to, you know, ultimately, you know, kind of maneuver the, you know, weighing the scouts' opinions, the coaches' opinions, you know, whether or not the Spanos family gets involved. We don't really know. I doubt it. Um, but, you know, so Tom Telesco has final say. But Brandon Staley is heavily involved in the process. Uh, next one from Senor. He says, Staley seems to give a lot of blind trust in some of these guys, i.e. Chris Rumpf. And then he wants also wants to know thoughts on Tillery possibly playing outside 6-7-9 technique and 5 technique. So um, first thing about the blind trust, I think that is true to an extent, like we saw with Eric Banks, like we saw uh, with some of his other guys, Trey Marshall, you know, who was kind of a, that free agent signing, and he just kept on trusting. So I, I think that's part of that is first year jitters, if you will, first year head coach kind of trying to figure out who he can mm-hmm. rely upon, who kind of knows his scheme, things like that. So um, I think like all things, Brandon Staley is going to improve uh, as a second year head coach. And I, I'm hoping that uh, the roster management aspect of coaching is something that he does improve upon. And I think he will. As for Jerry Tiller playing on the outside, like I guess on sub packages occasionally, but we also did this whole thing in 2020 with, with Gus Bradley and it didn't exactly go well. So I'm kind of over finding Jerry Tillery a spot, like <laughs> just play the other guys that are better. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, we've answered the Jerry Tillery at edge question 500 times. No. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say they have, there are some blind trust issues. I feel like, or, Maybe I'm just going to throw a guy out there and there's no accountability. I think accountability might be where I'd say it, not really blind trust as much as like, well, we're just going to trot out Murray, Tillery, and just like 80% of the snaps, baby, let's go. But Chris Rumpf, I don't want to say like there's blind trust. I just think it's a leap. Like if you trust him to be edge three, it's probably because they saw something. And there are things like in my mind, in our minds, we can create a scenario where Chris Rumpf has bulked up, improved, learned, makes this huge jump. It just to me, it just relying on it is pretty ridiculous. And and even then, even if you do believe in him, edge four at least do something there. I think the blind if if they go into the season with Jamal Adams and Ty Shelby as their edge four, that to me is is blind trust. Then it would be like, well, what did you base that off of? Of you know, the one guy hasn't played an undrafted free agent. Another guy was hasn't played in the NFL since 2019 when he had 15 snaps or whatever. Like that being your edge four is certainly a problem. Well, I mean, currently the edge four is uh, Tyler's best friend, M.K. Abele. Well, no Tom Telesco hasn't really talked about M.K. He's talked more about this, the Jamal Davis guy. So I, I kind of think that maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, Super chat from Alex Silva. Trust in the, Tom Telesco trusts in these CFL guys, XFL, et cetera. I'm sure they're just going to trust Jamal Davis to be edge three, edge four, like they did for Storm Norton. I, that is kind of a good point. I, I guess Storm Norton. I mean, Storm he, Norton beat his... out Trey Pipkins. Like they, I don't think they signed Storm Norton with the intent of having him be the swing yeah. tackle. I think he just beat out Trey Pipkins for that job. Trey Pipkins beat himself out. <laughs> <laughs> did did Norton play much in 2020? Um, he so did, he, he, he did towards the back half. Yeah, he, it was more towards I, the back end. Yeah. So when they played mm-hmm. the Saints, when Bulaga was injured, and then yeah. Tebby got injured, then he came in. Um, and then once they kind of got sick of Pipkins a little bit, it was they went to Norton at the end of the season. Yeah, one of my favorite stats from 2020 is that Storm Norton had the highest PFF grade of any Chargers offensive <laughs> lineman that year. <laughs> yeah, and look how that went, man. It was, it was like great stuff. So um i was looking at trey pipkins the other day because i was working on an, an article for lefb and um went back and looked at trey pipkins preseason numbers from this past year and it was it was very ugly it was not pretty at all um but yeah so we'll we'll see we'll talk a little bit about the offensive line in a second um just wanted to get to those super chat questions so um all right, let's let's uh, start with a positive note. Let's talk about our favorite picks first and foremost. 
Uh, Tyler, why don't you kick us off here? Okay, so I mean, I, I jumped and cheered and cried practically for Zion Johnson, but I'm not <laughs> going to get into that because yeah. uh, that's pretty obvious. Jamari Sailor, I'm waiting to hear what that medical issue, whatever it might have been, because I don't know why he would have fallen pretty much consistently a third round guy at the worst, maybe fourth, but sixth with odds. So I don't know what happened there. So as far as favorite picks go, but the next one that I actually found was my favorite has been the one I've been diving into a lot. And that is Isaiah Spiller. And I was, I don't remember where Alex had him ranked. I know I liked him more than Steven, um, but I wasn't like the biggest fan, but him in the fourth round, a guy that had a third round grade for me. And I believe ended up as like RB six for me was great. You know, it was funny watching chargers fans because who are the two most popular names Chargers fans wanted about in a certain you know range, realistic range, right? One was Jerome Ford. The other one was Pierre Strong Jr., who are these guys that have those those 40 times and has, have shown on tape they can hit those home runs. But then they take a player like Isaiah Spiller, who isn't a home run hitter, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, 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 okay, power back. Uh-huh, that's what we wanted. And, you know, how dare you question that, you know, they, they should have gotten yeah. a home run back. <laughs> Whatever. But even though he's a bigger back than what the Chargers have, He's not a power back. Like he, the numbers back that he's not an after contact sort of guy. You know, everyone kind of just jumped onto this idea that, you know, because of his weight and, you know, and his RAS, whatever, like maybe he's just a power back, but that, that's really not he, what he does. And he's not a home run hitter. But what he does do, it, it, there's three things at least I think that he does or has, hopefully, that the Chargers didn't last year. One, pretty obviously, outside of Austin Eckler, I should say. He's one of the better pass catching backs in the draft. Like that stood out to me immediately. Um, I just finally put all the clips together for our film breakdown. And you, I, I clips of him going, you know, the wheel, angle, swing, flat, whatever. Like a good receiving back, not just a guy who catches the swing pass and runs, catches the screen and runs, but is actually used out wide, used out of the backfield, all that sort of stuff. So I think that's great for the Chargers. Again, I joke, but it's true. Isaiah Spiller has more receiving yards than Larry Roundtree right now in the NFL. And so him entering, you know, becoming a part of this team, I just that's that's one of the two things I wanted, right? For the Chargers, I either wanted a you know home run hit, res score freak sort of guy, or a good pass catcher. Now, of course, why did I like Rashad White? Because he was a good combination of those two things. But for the Chargers to get at least a guy who's a good pass rusher, at, or excuse me, pass catcher at the very least, is great. Like I think that's undeniable. And then, you know, I think some of the frustrations we had with Ronchu with Kelly. Also being, you know, almost rookies or, or Roundtree being a rookie, not really touching the ball that much, is that you need someone who can frequently make guys miss those initial defensive penetrators miss because it's not always going to be clean. But you have to make something out of nothing sometimes. You know, I think Bruce Hall was great at that, and he went in the first yeah. round. And I think I think Isaiah Spiller, based on what I saw, now I did go back to 2020, and that does give you a bit uh, of a better look at him. I think Isaiah Spiller can definitely do that. He can at least make one guy miss. And Staley said, hey, you know, he's a guy who forced a lot of missed tackles. He's forced 100 missed tackles the last two seasons in the SEC. And, you know, that really speaks to what he can do there. And then finally, just overall, you have a guy, the last and maybe the most important thing, you just have a guy who can carry the rock so Austin Eckler just doesn't have to as much. And that seems like you can give that to anybody. But I think he can legitimately actually carry an offense potentially especially with this line that's going to be so much more you know so much better every year i think he's a guy who can really do that and let austin eckler be your other receiver you know maybe the chargers I, i'm hoping this is the case they didn't really address wide receiver in the draft because use austin eckler he's awesome he is their wide receiver three right now i could argue he could do as much in the passing game as mike williams maybe not really but kind of he's amazing so you know he's familiar with everything the chargers want to run um, so he got in terms of like just grading these guys, Isaiah Spiller got my third highest grade. You know, I gave him a B plus it, to me. You know, it, it's definitely a, a lot of it's about what who he isn't. Right. Which he's not yeah. an edge rusher, which is not a corner, whatever, something more valuable. And I did want them to wait a little bit longer. But, you know, there's only so long you can wait. Isaiah Spiller, I think, fits a lot of what they need, even as not a home run hitter, even as not a, a power back by any means. I think he's a guy. He's just going to hit the singles and doubles money ball. He gets on base. I think he's just always going to make something positive happen for the Chargers. And that's something they just really didn't have last year on a consistent basis. So that's my favorite pick out of the big two that I love. There we go. So we got a, a couple super stickers from uh, Mama Shoon. Shout out Mama Shoon. And then uh, Oregon Stacker. 
said uh, amazing show like always bolt up oh. so um shout out to them very kind words and, and actions <laughs> so um I'll, I'll jump in here about spoiler because i feel like i'm going to be in between uh the two of you guys on this one because i i will say you know spiller was my rb12 heading into the draft he's not typically like the running back that i kind of gravitate towards and you know maybe i was a little guilty of of what i wanted the chargers to do in that regard but you know kind of going back and revisiting some of spiller's staple from this past year and in 2020 i think i have a much clearer vision for what you know he is as a player and you know i totally understand the lack of athleticism in terms of his RAS, but you know, reportedly he hit 20 miles per hour on, on GPS tracking this past year. So I think he has speed. I just don't think he's like a 40 kind of player. But I, I think what has kind of become clear to me is really just the style of runner that he is. And I really love his vision first and foremost, and his ability to kind of see things pop up before they are really developing. And that's something that Tyler kind of pointed out on Twitter in terms of his, you know, peripheral vision. And so I think he's a very solid running back. He's a very safe running back because of his vision, because of his aloof, because of his elusiveness. And I was actually surprised to find uh, on PFF, you know, they measure, they actually measure elusiveness rating. And he was second in the class this past year. If you just kind of filter it uh, to the running backs with 50% of their carries and specifically to this draft class. So he measured out very well in that regard, measured out very well in yards after contact, not in terms of like Kenneth Walker in Miss Force Tackles who had like 99 or whatever, just some absurd number last year. But I think he's just a really solid running back, and I like the way that he runs in terms of his patience, in terms of his vision. And unlike the other two running backs that are on the Chargers roster, I think he can actually – have burst through the hole and see a hole opening up. And so that's kind of the difference. Like I think Joshua Kelly is unequivocally a better athlete than Isaiah Spiller, but he just, he cannot diagnose things, can't see things developing, whereas Spiller can. And, and like Tyler mentioned, I'm a big fan of the way he runs routes. I'm a big fan of just kind of the soft hands that he plays with. And so I, I can totally see the vision for the Isaiah Spiller pick. I think like Tyler, I, I also kind of wish they would have taken an edge rusher or a corner. But I think Spiller's going to be a really good player for this team, man. And I think it just gives them more options. So I have become more positive on Spiller in, in his role, even though he's not typically like my kind of player. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think he'll be kind of in the middle of what, you know, Tyler being his favorite pick and Alex probably being his least favorite pick. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so... Let's start positive. I do go. think, well, okay, first of all, no, I'm going to start negative. So <laughs> I see everyone posting in the chat, oh, he's an SEC back. He has all these yards. Do we so want to talk about who we did that with last year? <laughs> do we want to talk about how Larry LaRantry had 5,000 yards in, or so in the SEC? Okay. All right, now I'll talk about the positive. I do think Isaiah Spiller is better than Larry Roundtree and Joshua Kelly. Uh, what he can do receiving out of the backfield, good. I mean, I think he is a, a good enough route runner. Um, I don't know how much he'll be asked to like contribute in those situations just because I do think that is kind of more of an Austin Eckler thing at this point. Um, but I do think he is the best RB2 prospect the Chargers have had in a while. Um, you know, not the one I would have gone for, obviously, but probably the best person who's had a chance since Justin Jackson to legitimately back up Austin Eckler. Um, where I have a problem with this pick is obviously a, the round it was in. Now you can make the argument. And I know a lot of people have where it's like the value was there, right? This was a guy who was supposed to go in the late second, early third round. So if you're getting him in the fourth, that's good value, right? But it's still the position, not being a premium position, um, and really the the athletic traits that you kind of want in a running back not really being there, right? And I know that this is going to get into like 40 time RAS stuff, but Spiller's not, I mean, he's not slow, but he did run a 464. And I, you know, for me, I think you need a little bit more of that natural speed in the NFL than you do in the SEC per se. 
Um, obviously, you know, he is kind of like a break tackle machine. The cuts are good. But for me, I think the the lack of an ability to get to the second level quite as often uh, is going to be a problem uh, for, for, you know, and I think that gets magnified, particularly in the NFL. I think when we're talking about these backs um, that are, are prospects. So for me, that's kind of the thing that I, I don't like as much. And I think the big thing about Justin Jackson and why I think he was the second best or the best RB2 that Austin Eckler really ever had is he was fast enough, but obviously bigger than Austin Eckler and could make, you know, shifty enough movements, right? Like you, the then the philosophy after they trapped Justin Jackson just turned into, well, let's get this 6'5 running back who <laughs> runs the slowest I've ever seen, right? Like that was kind of the idea of, okay, Joshua Kelly, Larry Roundtree, obviously. Um, even going back to uh, Kalen Balage, right, in 2020, where it's like, okay, we have this 6'3 running back. We're going to bring him in. Eckler's hurt one week. Jackson's hurt one week. We're just going to bring this guy in. Um didn't like really work out that well. So for me, I do see the the upside of Spiller that you're getting, but I do think you do need a little bit more of that traditional speed, I guess. Uh, that that's kind of one thing. And you know, I I'm just not sold that this was the right direction to go with this pick. And now we're talking about Tom Telesco as a GM who's waste, you know, I don't want to say he's wasted the Spiller pick because we don't know if he has or he hasn't yet. But he's now pulled three straight day three picks uh, into running backs, which to me, as Arjun pointed out, uh, doesn't seem to be using your picks that effectively. Um, yeah. Obviously, we kind of all wanted them to draft a day three running back. But, you know, now Tom Telesco has taken two fourth round running backs and a sixth. Um, and so for me, that is something that just could have been used a little bit more effectively. Um, so that is kind of like my problem with the Spiller pick. Do I think ultimately he'll be fine uh, in being the RB2 and backing up Austin Eckler? Sure. Like, and I think he comes into the NFL with more raw attributes than you like uh, with Joshua Kelly uh, and uh, certainly Larry Roundtree. But for me, the, the problem with this pick, and I think something that we'll just come to realize is he I think the vision is there, but I think without that top end speed or at least kind of four or five speed, I do think that's going to get magnified in the NFL. And I don't think he's going to be breaking quite as many tackles or looking quite as shifty as he did in the SEC. Um, and I, I do believe some of that will be revealed to be a little bit of a compiler trait like Larry Roundtree was. So for me, I, I like Isaiah Spiller uh, enough to the point where I trust him to be the RB2 over Kelly and Roundtree. Um, but this pick is a miss for me. Yeah, I, I think if Isaiah Spiller is not the RB2, then you know we have serious problems in evaluation. Well, yeah. But of course, um, I think I, again, I really like the player at this point. I, I've become I've come around on him, and you know, I, revisiting that 2020 tape was was fantastic for me, and just kind of proved that I, I think he was kind of better that year. But it just the value in the process for me was was a little off. So, and, and again, you know, it kind of just depends on what you're valuing and what the team is, is kind of heading into in looking for in this draft. And maybe they were just kind of set on drafting a running back in the fourth round and, you know, kind of viewed Spiller as kind of that last one that they would take. So, right. um, again, you know, Spiller can certainly be successful. And I think in a world where you're not asking him to be, like a true every down player and yeah. like he was at Texas A&M for the most part. And then I think he'd be fine where the, the speed isn't like a deal breaker, but uh, it definitely, it, to me, like there's just kind of a disconnect between what we see from the, the outside zone heavy teams right. and what the chargers approach has been because even like Trey Sermon, right. Who was, you know, their kind of bruiser, like AJ Dillon, their guys running, you know, low four fives, high four fours. They have RES scores of, you know, eight or nine. And not to say that that's the end all be all, but I, it, it's just an interesting case study for me when you're looking at who the Niners have drafted, who the Packers have drafted, you know, who the Jets have kind of prioritized as they're kind of diving into the outside zone stuff and who the Rams have drafted. So it just is an interesting case study, I guess. But I do really like Spiller at this point. I, I've come around on him. I think he is going to be the best running back too that they have had. 
But again, that's kind of a low bar because Justin Jackson hasn't been healthy and the other two have been bad. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one more thing about Isaiah Spiller. Um, the Chargers, I think, have gone about this as they want, you know, a bigger back, you know, traditionally to complement Eckler, right? Like that's been their process still with this Isaiah Spiller pick, even though I think he is more multidimensional than um, the other guys that they've drafted. Like that's what they've wanted. But if you do have a bigger, slower running back, when Austin Eckler, you know, gets worn down or Austin Eckler is injured and has to miss a game, I think that that makes it harder for, you know, that kind of running back to do the thing that Austin Eckler does, right? I'm not saying Jerome Ford just subs in for Austin Eckler and he would be great. <laughs> like That's not really what I'm saying at all. But I do think you want someone who has the potential to be that home run hitter, to catch out of the backfield, to be a little bit more athletic than, you know, just subbing in Spiller if Austin Eckler is getting, you know, a little bit worn down because that that's what happened last year, uh, obviously, when Austin Eckler was begging for RB2 production. And so for me, um, I, I just see that as the Chargers process has been trying to get these guys to sort of like step up when Eckler hasn't, you know, been able to or, you know, it has gotten worn down at a certain point in the season. I'm just not sure if you just keep drafting bigger, taller, slower running backs that they're ultimately going to be able to do or replace some of the things that Eckler does uh, when when he isn't able to go out there. I feel good about this one. I feel good about yeah. it. Like I said, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle here, which is totally fine with me. Um, the good news is obviously that, you know, it wasn't necessarily a perceived reach. I no, no, it wasn't. You know, like if they had taken, you know, like uh, who was the LSU running back that the Niners drafted that was like consensus RB like 15 and they took him in the third round. So this is fine oh, value. Um, I forget his name. Doesn't he have two names or something like Tyrion, that? It was like Tyrion David Price or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it was fine value. I do think that if they hadn't taken one in the fourth round, they kind of would, would have just been screwed because there was that big run on running back. So like I said, I'm okay with the pick. It, it's not a sexy pick, but uh, I think it's fine. So my favorite pick, I'll go next. I, I've talked a lot about Jamari Salyer, and I could certainly make an argument for him here, but I'm actually going to go with JT Woods, man. JT Woods uh, is oh, somebody okay. that I've become – a really big fan of revisiting him and, and watching his film and kind of listening how he fits in terms of this specific scheme. And then also like the more I thought about it, the more I thought back of last season, there were specific moments in the season where they specifically lost games because they had issues on the back end. And so you talk about like the, the game against the Minnesota Vikings where, you know, they're, <laughs> they're really starting to, Put you know Nazi Adderley a little bit more in the box and the slot, and they're doing the same thing with Derwin James, and and you have a guy like Trey Marshall in the back end of the defense, and I specifically remember this this play on film where um, Justin Jefferson is running a go route on the left sideline, and Adam Thielen was like so obviously running an in breaking route, and it was clearly like that's where the play was going to go, and. Everybody, I feel like everybody could tell, like when you're watching the film back, that it was going to Adam Thielen. It was like third and 14 in the fourth quarter. And I'm looking at Trey Marshall, and he, like, you can just tell on film that he had like zero confidence that he could make this play because he just couldn't. Like, he doesn't have that kind of burst, that kind of closing speed, and the ball skills to go make that play. If he had, then the Chargers would have won that game because they were still winning. They would have gotten that stop on fourth down. And then the Chargers would have had the ball and they would have won. So instead of Trey Marshall back there or Alohi Gilman, same kind of thing, just so limited athletically and with the ball skills, you just don't have that kind of athlete back there. So now you get JT Woods back there who ran, ran a 4 3 9. And, and I think he's a little bit more raw than people are kind of realizing. And again, that's okay. He's a third round pick. There's specifically like tackling issues that he needs to clean up on. But you look at the speed, you look at the ball skills. And the instincts, which is something that me, Tyler, and Arjun sat down uh, in looking at all of his missed tackles. He was always in the right spot. It's just the technique issues were not there. And so you look at JT Woods and the things that he can open up for this team, and specifically for Derwin James and Nasir Adderley, it, it, it's the theme of the offseason, right? It just gives him more 
options to do more things and be able to play more nickel, more dime, because JT Woods now has that athleticism. He has that skill set to be an eraser back there and, and make plays. Like another theme of the offseason, right? Like just go get the ball and go make a play. Last year, they didn't have that player. And it really bounces out that safety room nicely with Mark Webb potentially being kind of a big nickel player for them or big box safety. And so if you fix the tackling issues, which I, I feel confident that they can, because he does have such a good processor, then I think you're looking at a very high upside player here, not just kind of a, a, a dart throw third round pick that everybody was kind of saying like, oh, this is just Telesco doing his normal third round shit. Like I think JT was legitimately has the upside here to be a very high quality player for them. Yeah, I completely agree. And I was just trying to show some of what he can do. Just that first play, you guys can see it if you're watching. If you're not watching, then oh well. Yeah, it's it's it is it does feel very different than what like so there's not it is a reach, but it's like a round reach, and I could justify the reach even though it is one. I do think get him around later, but hey, I get it. Like at the very least, I understand why they would go after someone like this. Like you can see him, yeah, you know, in, in the yellow arrow here, and just how he triggers downhill and is able to make plays like this. Something that you it took years for Nasir Adderley to figure out how to do. Now there's also some misses in here. Don't get me wrong. But what he can do and what his instincts, like everyone, everyone had this I word, instincts, intelligence, whatever it is. Like everyone had something related to him just being a smart football player. And I believe he was a five-time honor roll guy too. Like, by the way, the Chargers taking everybody with a PhD is ridiculous. Like, I can't, be I can't believe <laughs> yeah. how many geniuses are in this draft class. Um, but he's just, there's so much to work with there. Like, you know, he, he is a project. Eh, He's going to not be great year one. Like he's not going to be the great safety year one by any means. Right. Um, but there's so much to work with there. I, I really, he was, I, I mean, yes, I, but the two guards are my favorite. But after Spiller, so fourth, Woods was my next favorite because, again, even like Spiller, while you might have wanted something else, you, you can still see the vision. You get the plan for why they took him. Like I understand yeah. why JT Woods is now a member of the Los Angeles Chargers and why they took him in the third round because. He's very talented, and the Chargers just did not have that. You know, we're talking about RAS scores on this show. Mark Webb, Alohi Gilman, what is it, four, three? You know, Mark Webb's is awful. Alohi Gilman's is fine, I think. You know, you finally get someone back there to move your players around. It's a great ripple effect. It's great for what the team wants to do. I like Woods a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like the JT. I, I was a little bit confused by the JT Woods pick when it first sure. happened. Um, and, and sort of, you know, we did kind of get into like, oh, could have been around earlier. Or like um, they needed offensive tackle here. But for me, uh, I think the kind of player that you're getting that you could just kind of plug into this daily system. It's it's honestly like a seamless fit um, into him getting into that uh, Derwin Nas, uh, you know, now uh, Woods rotation and then the ability to kind of replace Adderley. And I, I don't think. The tackling thing is as much of a problem as maybe I thought it was when the pick was initially made, because I, I do think you watch the film and those issues are pretty correctable, whether Staley corrects them or not, or whether Woods corrects, the, uh, corrects them or not remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, but for me, yeah, no, I think there's uh, a lot to like about the JT Woods pick, even though you can make the argument that maybe they could have gone someone else there. Yeah, I think they could, right? But I, I think from an, you know, an athletic profile standpoint and just kind of what they're fit is going to be for him like he's going to come in and contribute right away and he's going to be you know that third safety potentially match up with some tight end so he's not going to have to be asked to be on an island you know filling the run and making a ton of tackles like the one that we just showed against tcu and then you know we talked about safety as a, as a sneaky need right and potentially you're looking at a team without nausea adderley next year so you know jt woods can become that guy in 2023 so um, like Tyler mentioned, I mean, obviously Zion's like my favorite favorite, right? Like a, he was a guy who I was championing for, and, and I mentioned Salyer, but I think Woods was. I just wanted to spotlight him for a little bit. Um, Alex, favorite pick of the draft, man. Say full. Back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about Jamari Salyer first, because we all did our preamble. It's like I could talk about Jamari Salyer, but I'm going to talk about someone else. Yeah. Um, so. I, no, I, I I really do like the the salary pick. I mean, the value that they got there is great. You know, obviously, like Tyler said, kind of medical withstanding, depending on you know how that goes. But I think the value they got there is great. I will talk about the only Alex who is on the Chargers. That is Alexander Xander Horvath. There you go. Um, 
I, you know, I, so I left the draft in like the sixth round and I came home and I saw the seventh round pick was a fullback. I was like, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> um, and that was like my initial reaction. But then I saw, you know, Xander Orvath play and I'm like, okay, this is something to work with. Um, I mean, you know, obviously the RAS is there tested like a freak. Uh, but like, to me, like it shows up on tape. Like obviously he can receive out of the backfield has played a little bit of fullback running back and tight end. Uh, and you know, this kind of brought me back to the, was it the 2020 off season, which was the famous, uh, Gabe neighbors, Bobby Holly, uh, election, uh, to, <laughs> you to the had, fullback you had to bring it up, man. You just, yeah. You just... Gotta keep and, that night. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the the selling point for uh you know Gabe Neighbors was versatility, 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 mm-hmm. versatility. And Gabe Neighbors all of last year was a healthy scratch. Yeah. <laughs> like, so they didn't, you know, obviously different coaching staffs, mm-hmm. but they really didn't end up using him. So for me, this pick shows a guy who I think might be the best running back that they took on day three. Okay. Uh, I'm just <laughs> oh, fuck. Uh, oh, I'm just shit at this point. <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Uh, but I do think you know you can legitimately use him as a pass catching option out of the backfield. And you know, it, to me, having a fullback with more utility and more versatility yeah. than neighbors at this point, I think is a huge upgrade. Um, and he, he just seems like a guy that can, I think, be sort of a yak monster, like even in the NFL, I don't think you're going to see him like actually show up on the running back depth chart. Like I said today, or, you know, I guess he would kind of be like a tight end four and like, maybe that Steven Anderson kind of role. Like maybe that's kind of where he'll show up as well. Um, but to me getting a fullback who I think is a factor in the game yeah, it's not a sexy pick, but again, we're in the seventh round, and I think this is probably like the best, like immediate impact guy you could have gone for at that point. So for me, uh, I-, I like Alex Horvath. I'm really yeah. curious what he ends up doing for the Chargers because obviously they let Steven Anderson go, and when he was when when Horvath was drafted, they said, "Oh, you know, fullback." But like, I'm, I'm showing these clips, and I went through, and it was maybe one blocking play per game in the run game like there's some pass protection sure but that was natural as him being a running back for them he just blocked on third down or whatever this guy is a weapon out of the backfield i'm really curious if they do away with that h-back sort of steven anderson type of role and just go with a more weaponized fullback role like gabe neighbors should have been so again i think that he should be he like initially they took fullback i'm like okay well Steven Anderson replacement, and maybe he could be. If anyone can take a guy who barely blocked and turn him into a really good blocking H back, it's Kevin Coger, who did that with Steven Anderson. But yeah. based on his role in college, he only had 37 running blocking snaps. Yeah. So, like, what is his role? Right. Uh, to I, me, I, I think yeah. it ends up being just that weaponized, you know, fullback sort of type. And, you know, it's blasphemous, but he does compare favorably in the RAS score. To a certain 49ers fullback as well. Not saying they're the same. Yuschek also blocks the hell out of his job for sure. Yeah. But, you know, there's definitely some similarities there in terms of a weapon. So, you, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think he's the best running back they took on day three by any means. <laughs> I know, I know. But I could see why he, he could be for his seventh round value, you know, a legit weapon for this team. And technically, if you count him as a starter, they added a starter in the seventh round. That could be yeah. used for, you know, a couple touchdowns here, a couple runs there. So, you know, again, w- would it have been nice to go edge rusher and probably just sign this guy as an undrafted free agent? Probably. But again, I can see the role for him. A weaponized fullback sounds pretty cool to me. But also, what team are the Chargers? Like, we can talk about this later, but what team are the Chargers becoming? Are they a run first, run heavy team with Justin Herbert as their quarterback? Is Herbert going to run more this offseason? Because they just got guards and guards and guards and fullbacks and and running backs from the sec like what team are we this year yeah no it's a, it's an interesting trend and the chargers kind of going towards this path and i almost wonder right like how much influence did the best player available approach have with them because you kind of feel like that was the vibe that we got from them in terms of zion and jt woods and jamari sally at minimum were clearly the best players on their board and now you take this fullback. And I have to say, like, from a roster construction standpoint, I'm a fan of this pick, like, alone. 
because in my head, I was like, okay, like they're going to try and replace the Steven Anderson role. And, you know, I had them taking Chase Allen with the, with the 260 pick in, in our dueling mock drafts. And I was like, okay, like here's your H back type. And now you don't need four tight ends and a fullback because, you know, if you take a tight end who you're trying to do the H back stuff with, you still have Gabe neighbors and you're still like talking yourself into Gabe neighbors. Now they can just keep three tight ends and the one fullback, Xander Horvath, and then you free up a roster spot. So that's the that's the positive takeaway just from a roster building standpoint that they're not going to have to waste a spot on either the tight end. You know, Trey McKitty was inactive for the first half and then it was Gabe Neighbors. Now you just keep the three tight ends, the one fullback, and we're good. And we're good. We don't have to keep another roster spot for somebody instead of like a defensive lineman or a defensive end or a corner or whatever. So I don't know. Yeah. Tom Telesco know. hears that and he's going to go four quarterbacks, five running backs <laughs> this year. <laughs> he's going to keep the undrafted quarterback from Illinois as well as Easton Stick and Chase Dan. Um, But no, I think the Xander Horvath pick, it just gives, again, it just gives him more versatility because with Gabe Neighbors, right? Like he was a tight end in college. He was. He wasn't a fullback in college. Right. And so you're like teaching him the fullback stuff. And now with Xander Horvath, like, you're, you're going to teach him the fullback stuff, but he's also a capable runner and pass catcher. So he's he's got most of it down. It's just he's going to have to work on the blocking. But the man is built like an absolute tank. Like I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to be able to learn how to block effectively. So, you know, Xander probably much lower on my list in terms of favorites. But again, I can see the path forward here. I under, I like the roster building process and it Maybe he does become their Kyle Juszczyk, man. I think like that's a, a fun outcome, obviously. Right. I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I watched all 37 uh, Xander Horvath uh, pass or run blocking snaps. Like, <laughs> that's not what I did. But I in, in the blocking snaps that I did watch, I thought I saw a guy who is a willing blocker, right? Like, you know, there was never a point where I thought he like backed down from it or, you know, just got roasted like doing it. Um, so for me, sort of in the vein of what we talked about with JT Woods and the tackling problem, like I think that is something that's fixable in the NFL and it's easier to, you know, kind of learn how to block, uh, you know, as someone who's already experienced the fullback, then learn how to play fullback uh, in the vein of Gabe Neighbors, like Stephen just said. Sure. Yeah. And along with what Stephen already said, too, about, you know, now you can only you only have to carry three tight ends and a fullback. I think the same thing was with Spiller. You know, you don't have to worry about Jackson's health. Or which running back do we want to keep between these other two? Maybe Bradwell. No, I think you can actually just keep three running backs now and a fullback. So you, you, I think you do save a tight end spot, and I do think you save a running back spot with their picks. So that is going to be critical. I think that does save some of the jobs for someone like a, even it could be Kimon Hall, it could be Brady Fahoka, it could be Joe Gaziano, whatever. Like I think you can yeah. find other ways to get some of these guys that you should have kept early, and now actually keep them on your roster this year rather than let you know John Brannon as that was his name last year. You know, again, uh, Cortez Brown, Tyron Johnson, those guys maybe could stick around this year if they do, if they don't carry four running backs and four tight ends and a fullback. But cross my fingers and three quarterbacks <laughs> and uh, all this yeah. other shit. So, <laughs> again, I really hope that the roster management is something that Brandon Staley improves upon this year. So, um, mm -hmm. all right, we'll do. Uh, there are a couple of questions in here that I do want to get to, but we're going to do kind of a depth chart analysis mm -hmm. next episode. And so we'll kind of answer some of those questions, you know, wrong speedy asking about the right tackle position and how, you know, mm -hmm. Tom Tusk's comments may have changed a little bit. Um, but we'll wrap it up here with just class grades. Obviously we're not going to go pick by pick. It's already been an hour, 20 minutes. So um, Alex, we'll start with you, your grade for the 2022 chargers draft class. I'll go B. I mean, for me, there were enough value picks to the point, you know, I mean, I gave three of the, of the individual picks in A uh, in terms of uh, Zion Johnson, Salier, and and Horvath. Like, I, I thought those were all good value for what you're getting in those rounds. Um, and while I have a problem with the Spiller pick still, I, I still think you see enough there to the point where he's a more capable RB2 than the other guys. Um, and, you know, I, I don't believe he has, like, high upside, but can at least play immediately. Um, you know, some of the draft in terms of the high upside is like limited a little bit by the fact that they didn't have a second round pick and, and weren't able to go in that direction. Um, but for me, I, th I thought JT Woods was a solid pick and there was no pick where 
even though I didn't really like the process on Spiller, where I was like, man, that pick sucked. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously with Larry Roundtree, that was how I was like last year. Um, didn't really like the Alohi Gilman pick, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the year prior, where they just went completely off the board. Uh, so for me, there weren't really any of those big reaches that we've seen um, in previous seasons from the Chargers and obviously other teams uh, in the draft as well. So for me, uh, I'll go with a B. I will also go with a B. Again, it's it's not as much about the players that were selected because I can go through here and tell you how, unfortunately, I don't feel that uh, the who was the corner they took later. Um, Leonard. Leonard. I don't feel that he's going to contribute, and I think there's a chance he doesn't make the roster. But I can see I could make a case for how seven out of eight of these guys contribute, you know, fit with the team, all that. Some good value, some maybe not so good value. So I think it's a nice B, and that's kind of feels about right. You know, I watched Bootleg Football podcast, and those guys, you know, put together a list of honorable mentions and then their top three favorite drafts. And the honorable mentions had like 15 teams on it for some reason. And then they had their top three and the Chargers didn't make one of those 15 honorable mentions. So they may have been in the one after that. I don't know, but it just kind of feels like a good draft. Pretty good. Uh, to me, I think a lot of this could hinge on, on Sailor. Uh, no, nah, it doesn't hinge on Sailor, but like you could bump this thing to an A pretty quick. If you're telling me that he's competing and wins right tackle, that changes a lot. But based on the way things are right now, it's a B. Like I think it's a solid draft with good players who fit what they want, who will contribute. I just the grade is lowered because I don't know who their edge four or potentially three is. Yeah, I think there are enough question marks for me to be like, okay, this isn't an A, even though I, I think picking Zion is an A. Um, but to me, really, the only pick that I didn't like or that I at least don't like understand is the Dean Leonard one because I just like I don't see how he has a clear cut path to making the roster this year. So you're essentially wasting a pick right there, and, and maybe that. You know, Dean Leonard becomes kind of uh, a solid depth corner for them. I don't really know, but um, it's just tough after the Bryce Callahan signing, which is official, by the way. Chargers did uh, just did post that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a B for me. You know, we'll, we'll the Jamari Salyer thing is something that we are going to discuss in terms of his potentially talk uh, starting at right tackle. That's something that Brandon Thorne uh, mentioned in his article recently, his post draft notebook, and so. If he's is their starting right tackle, right, then that changes things. So, um, but I, I think it's a very solid draft. It's obviously, not a, a super sexy draft that's going to steal a lot of headlines. You know, there's not a ton of, you know, Chargers are the winners of the draft kind of takes going around. But I think the Chargers just needed to become a more balanced team. I think they needed to become a deeper team. And I think for the most part, they did that outside of the, the edge rusher position. So um, I think this is, I think we're all on the same page that we like this draft. Don't love it. Don't dislike it. Yep. Uh, about Bryce Callahan's deal, I don't think anybody has tweeted the official marks there yet. I can't imagine it's super high. We know it's a one-year deal, uh, but financially, we don't know that number. So, um, yeah, so we'll kind of see what happens there. Um, we have tons of post-draft content coming for you guys later on this week. I actually just jumped off of an interview with the Georgia beat writer for 247 Sports. Uh, gave me a lot of good information on Jamari Sawyer, who, like I said, we'll talk more about at a later date. And then uh, Nick Cothra from Sports Illustrated joined me. So I'm going to do interviews with all of the 247 Sports writers that I can get my hands on and talk about some of these picks. And uh, a certain draftee is going to be joining Matty Schmidt uh, potentially in the next couple of weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that one as always. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please leave us a rating or a view. If you're watching this in the stream or replay, make sure and like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for us today, guys. As always, thanks for the support and the uh, um, all the comments today, all the super chats. We'll see you next time.